Okay. Um, last time we had started discussing um, basically controlled thermonuclear fusion, and we had gone through, let's say, some of the alternates that don't particularly work. And so now I want to concentrate today on some that do, but the first, uh, or are thought to be able to, and the first one I need to discuss is actually inertial confinement fusion. Um, inertial and confinement are maybe a bad juxtaposition of words because inertial really means get it over with quick before everything uh, flies apart, whereas confinement means hold together. Uh, so, but people call it inertial confinement. Um, Basically, inertial confinement's been with us, uh, with us meaning uh, seriously considered, um, actually since the, early, uh, since the early 70s. And it got started actually as a response um, in part to uh, weapons um, uh, test ban treaties. Uh, the sort of idea was that you could, with a laser uh, ignite a little pellet and a DT pellet and therefore produce a very small hydrogen bomb from which you could do uh, weapons tests. But also, it's always had a hope, uh, the, the so-called inertial confinement schemes have always had a hope that they would be able to, in addition, produce uh, an energy production system. So, but even to this point, to this day, uh, it's more as a uh, weapon simulation uh, program and classified, I might say, in large part. Um, but it's also um, uh, power production possibilities. Uh, those are not being explored nearly as much uh, these days because the funding is more limited for that than it is for the weapons uh, simulations. So anyway, just to tell uh, what it's about, inertial here means again get it over with quick. And so what you basically do is you, in, um, is you have a small pellet. Uh, so what you do is you inject, let's just say, energy into a, um, I'm going to call it a small pellet, which is on the order of uh, one centimeter in size. Um, and then what you do is you actually uh, compress the pellet. It's a, a pellet, it's a solid here. You compress by 10 times in the radius and hence in the volume you compress by about a factor of a, th a thousand, so you go to something like a thousand times solid density. You compress it to that. And in the process of uh, adding energy also, you uh, heat. Um, and so you produce a pellet with a, a delta X spatial size, let's put it that way, of the order of uh, 0.1 centimeter. Now, the pellet density after you have um, done this compression, and we'll talk a little more about this in a moment, uh, would then be of the order of 10 to the 3 times solid density. And hence, that's a, something in the range of 10 to the 24th uh, per centimeter cubed. Very, very dense. And we're going to put in enough energy in principle, and we'll come back to that in a moment, to heat all of this up to an ion temperature of 10 kilovolts. Okay? So you might ask, well, I had this criterion. The criteria for having fusion were twofold. One was that we need an ion temperature of the order of 10 kilovolts or greater. But we also need an N tau E density times energy containment time greater than uh, 10 to the 14th, we decided, centimeters cubes uh, seconds. So how long do we need our system 
uh, well, I'm sorry. Actually, for these systems, often the temperature is less than 10 kilovolts, and so it turns out you need more like 10 to the 15th. So how long a density do I require, or I'm sorry, how long a time do I require at this density? Well, just, you know, divide them, and you, what you find is that you need an energy containment time of 10 to the minus 9th seconds, one nanosecond. Now, is that easy to arrange? Is that in the ballpark or, you know, or a problem or what? Well, we can ask, suppose I have, what's the transit time of a 10 kilovolt ion through a medium which is only a tenth of a centimeter across? Well, the, that time scale would be, uh, you know, that delta X divided by the ion thermal velocity. And so this would be 0.1 centimeters. And what was the ion thermal velocity? Well, we calculated it, and it was 10 to the 6th meters per second, or 10 to the 8th centimeters per second. And so this is about 10 to the 9th seconds, or a nanosecond as well. So indeed, you know, I, if I can compress this pellet by 1,000, uh, 10 to 1 air, uh, uh, linear scaling, a uh, linear compression, um, 1,000 to 1 in density, um, and then I'll heat the ions to 10 kilovolts in the process, then I will indeed be able to, um, you know, before it flies apart, I will have um, done some uh, fusion, hopefully, and surely dense enough, um, you know, for that. Now, um, let's uh, continue on in this line, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, so the criteria for inertial confinement fusion, or criteria, or the, the kind of what you're trying to do, is you must uh, heat and compress a pellet, uh, let's say of uh, uh, D plus T, maybe, that, you know, maybe frozen ice pellets, it turns out, um, to of the order of 10 to the 24th per centimeter cube density in a time scale delta T of order 1 nanosecond. Um, you can ask, and we could figure out, but I'll just give you the number here. How much do you think you really need in energy deposited in this pellet to heat it up to 10 kilovolts and, and so forth? Well, there's actually been an experiment on this in the last few years which have demonstrated that in fact what you need is round about 5 to 10 megajoules um, to do this and it was done in a so-called um, centurion halide experiment and frankly what that is is a um, uh, hydrogen bomb underground explosion and what they apparently did, although it's relatively classified, is they um, put a little pellet of DT in the region around where the uh, hydrogen bomb went off and had the little pellet also go off by virtue of, of the x-rays that um, heated the pellet. And so they could determine approximately how much energy uh, they need to do that. Um, by the way, anybody know how much a megajoule is in energy? I mean, have a physical feel for it? Somebody once characterized it to me that a megajoule is equivalent to the energy stored in a jelly donut <laughs> in the uh, calorie content in that case, of course. But uh, anyway, some feeling for a megajoule. It's not all that much energy in a way. But anyway, um, where do we, uh, let, let's uh, make an observation. Uh, remember, we had to get this energy in within a nanosecond, right? So roughly speaking, how much, if we were going to, say, do this by a laser or what's called a driver, uh, you know, that's going to put in this energy, what's the power level? Well, it's of the order of, let's say, uh, 10 megajoules divided by the time scale on which I have to put it in, 10 to the minus 9th seconds. And so that's round about 10 to the 16th watts, joules per second or watts, right? That's a rather large number. Uh, what's more, I have to do it 
uh, into a target, a of order one centimeter squared target. So it's rather highly focused, this huge amount of power. Now, how does it sort of actually work? Well, there's sort of two, uh, let's call it two approaches to laser fusion or inertial confinement fusion, two, two basic types. One is called direct drive. And here what you imagine is you have your little pellet here sitting here. Uh, well, maybe we ought to make it sort of round, you know. And what you do is you just, it's, it's a more or less solid pellet. Um, and this is the sort of unclassified portion of the business. And you somehow arrange a whole bunch of laser beams to come in, okay, and deposit all this energy. So you have a big laser beam assembly and you, you know, route them around different directions so they all hit the pellet at the same time, it turns out. Um, the uh, other approach is called indirect drive. And this is a, the direct drive is uh, done by primarily the University of Rochester and Naval Research Laboratories and is more or less an unclassified program. The indirect drive is the classified one, and roughly speaking, what you do is you have a, a thin shell uh, pellet and then a, a DT pellet inside of that, and the idea is that you, um, again, put the um, energy in laser light or whatever uh, onto the pellet, and then, however, that instead of just compressing, the main thing that the pellet, that this outer layer does, made out of gold or various things, is it produces further, uh, or it produces x-rays, and the x-rays then, okay, uh, permeate the pellet here, being of much shorter wavelength, uh, and and so you use a, a gold or, or high Z material to convert the laser light, basically, in some sense, into X-rays, which then illuminate uh, the pellet and perform this compression for you, and so forth and so on. Um, now, there's some plasma physics considerations that come into all this. Um, namely, uh, suppose I'm about halfway. Well, you know, I, I'm start off with the. Um, the driver, the, the I'm sorry, the, I apply the my laser for mm, towards a nanosecond or something like that, and then I um, I start heating up this medium and I quickly get it into a plasma state, but maybe it's got some density profile, okay, some plasma density profile which looks something like this. It's maybe you know has a tail that extends out. And because that's a density, you remember that the plasma frequency squared, at least, okay, is proportional to density. And for any particular laser light, for example, there's some particular place at which the frequency is equal to the electron plasma frequency. Now, what would happen where the frequency was, was of the order of the plasma frequency? Well, what happens is that the wave would propagate into this region where, you know, the frequency is equal to plasma frequency, and it'd turn around and it'd actually get reflected, remember, off the plasma at that point. But in the process, it would, you know, while getting reflected, it would really accelerate a lot of particles right at that interface. And this causes a phenomenon which is called laser blow-off. Uh, you know, you you basically cause the outer shell here to kind of pull off from the rest of the pellet and just get blown off in hot electrons, it turns out. How can I avoid this? Well, if I get the frequency high enough above the sort of density that I want to finally compress to, then I'll always be able to penetrate, okay, because it's only frequencies below the plasma frequency that don't penetrate. So a consider that's one consideration, 
or a particular consideration, which leads one to want to do fairly um, high frequency um, um, a light or laser light and so forth. So let's say to avoid laser blow off, of hot electrons, uh, at omega of order omega PE surface, want, we would like to have, the frequency is always greater than the omega PE, with the omega PE being at 10 to the 24th per uh, cubic centimeter. What frequency is that? Well, if you remember our plasma frequency, it was 56 times the square root of density in uh, MKS units. And so that's 56 times the square root of 10 to the 24th times uh, 10 to the 6th to get it in 10 to the, well, to get it right units. That's 10 to the 30th, take the square root, and this becomes 6 times 10 to the 16th. Um, so uh, that gives us... Uh, a plasma frequency if we divide by 2 pi of about 10 to the 16th. What would the wavelength of that frequency radiation or light be? Well, that would translate into a, a lambda is equal to a velocity of light over frequency of, you know, 3 times 10 to the 8th for the velocity of light and 10 to the 16th. And this gives us 3 times 10 to the minus 8th meters. How big is that? Well, 3 times 10 to the minus 8th meters would be 0 0.03 microns, micrometers. Okay? What kind of stuff is that? Well, it turns out that's a pretty short wavelength light in the kind of um, bluish side of the business. Okay? So what pragmatically people do is you'd like less than a tenth micron light around that range. So they use um, one of the most popular ones at the moment is that people use three omega, uh, that is to say the third harmonic of uh, the frequency of neodymium glass light. So neodymium, I think that's spelled right, I'm not sure. Um, anyway... Uh, what you do is you get neodymium glass lasers and then you pass it through a nonlinear crystal which up converts with something like 70 or 80 percent efficiency it turns out uh, the light to the third harmonic and so it's a very high frequency. Now there's another rather interesting plasma physics sort of effect. Um, if this uh, Lambda, this wavelength is 0.03 microns. So how, how well could I focus a, um, a beam of, of laser light? Well, I could focus it down to something like a few wavelengths, okay? So that would be maybe a micron or something like that. So the kind of problem you get into is that here's the pellet, let's say, and your laser light, you remember our pellet was going to be 0.1 centimeter, right? So that's pretty big compared to, you know, 10 or about micron types uh, laser beams. So the problem you can get into is the surface of the plasma can actually uh, develop um, Rayleigh-Taylor type instabilities because you're pushing on it with a tremendous light pressure. Okay, and if that light pressure is slightly asymmetric, then you can imagine really, you know, breaking up that surface. So you can have Rayleigh-Taylor um, type instabilities. But what people do is they are possible, let's say. Um, what people do is that they simply arrange to have, they, they, they put their light beam through a sort of defocuser or defaser so that um, 
uh, so you take your, your light beam, uh, so that the various beamlets go at various slightly different phases, and they, but they all have the same frequencies and they all overlap, so that instead of getting a very localized um, uh, response, you, you, you get an, an, an overall phase averaged, fa wave phase averaged uh, flux, which is more or less homogeneous. But anyway, that's a sort of complication, let's just say. Now, I've been talking about or commenting upon really laser fusion, but there's really other so-called drivers for this inertial confinement fusion. Um, so I'd like to summarize the laser fusion situation a little bit by talking about those. So um, let's call this uh, inertial fusion drivers. And I'll try to indicate what status they're at. And so inertial fusion uh, drivers. Um, lasers, as we said, it, it, it would appear that we need to put on the order of 5 to 10 megajoules on target. Um, to date, the best that's been done uh, is somewhat over uh, 10 kilojoules down about three orders of magnitude. But there's a pros proposal called, uh, at the moment called the uh, LMF, um, Laser Microfusion Facility, which would go up into the 100 kilojoule to one megajoule, and maybe a few megajoule type uh, range, uh, megajoule type facility. Anyway, uh, so, but, but the plasma physics experiments demonstrating these Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities and, you know, interaction of these very, very intense waves with matter, uh, been going on for a number of years and are very interesting for nonlinear processes of the type that Chen discussed in Chapter 8, if you remember, all kinds of um, types of instabilities that can come up because, or, and nonlinearities just because of this tremendously intense light. Uh, another one that people uh, talk about is so-called, well, let me first do electron beams, and actually what they are is relativistic electron beams. But, you know, we were trying to um, focus all this energy on a very, very small spot, tenth of a centimeter. Or, well, it starts out as a centimeter. Okay, that's not a very big spot. And the problem is if I try to make an electron beam rather focused, that means I take a bunch of electrons and try to get them all at the same place. That builds up a very high charge density. And actually, you know, there's a, then a repulsion of all the electrons. So it turns out that it's rather difficult to um, focus beams well enough uh, to small targets, basically. Because of um, charge, well, self-interaction. charge density. Um, another one, though, is uh, ion beams. And uh, that's how a similar consideration, uh, and sometimes these are called light ion beams, and I'll come back to heavy ion beams in a moment, uh, but uh, easier with, um, with light ions um, because of the fact that um, uh, well, they're, ma they're more massive, so it takes more of a self, uh, uh, more of a charge density, producing more of an electric field to make them move. Basically, um, this is sort of of inertial confinement fusion. This is probably 90 percent of the program at the moment. Uh, light ions is probably uh, say 7 percent or something like that. Uh, how would I create a light ion beam? By the way, well, you just take some ions, you create some ion source, and you just accelerate them. And there's various ways to try to accelerate them in about uh, a nanosecond. I won't go into the details of that. The other one is so-called heavy ion beams. And there, um, what the idea is, is that you actually use, uh, oh, say, a uranium ion or something like that, 
and you use one of the uh, large accelerators which have been built for other purposes and you you so let's just say you accelerate um, like uranium 235 you don't have to use that I mean that's fissionable but you, so you maybe let's say uranium 238 then make it less valuable stuff anyway uh, to on the order of GeV per nu uh, or GeV per nucleon but um, and then what you do is you slam that into the target okay uh, and and then focus on the target and People think that this would be quite uh, interesting, and there are studies. Uh, I'm just guessing here, but you know something like three percent of the inertial confinement program. Uh, but the comment is that to test this is rather difficult at the moment because you need a high intensity. It's not just a regular accelerator. You have to actually have a very high current, high intensity accelerator in order to produce enough heavy ions to really focus enough energy on target. And the accelerator you need to do the first experiment is a few billion dollars, it turns out. So it's a little tough to do the first experiment in this particular regard. And so people are interested in this, but it's kind of hard to get it moving, let's say. Um, and, but people still keep looking at it. Okay, so that sort of, so basically laser fusion, uh, by the way, in one sense, uh, claims to have demonstrated their scientific feasibility by these classified centurion halide experiments. Um, and they think that they need to deliver about 5 to 10 megajoules on target. The problem then is to get lasers up to that level, uh, again, depositing the power in something less than a nanosecond, there's certain elements of actually tens of picoseconds they want to get down to for the shaping of the laser pulse so that you deposit it in the shells you really want to and stuff like that. Uh, so they're even faster things. But anyway, and, and so there's some uh, progress along that line. Um, okay, now let me go on to then uh, magnetic confinement. Um, and here, uh, what we're one is into is a much longer time scale process. Uh, here we go for seconds, let's say, of energy confinement, whereas we were going for nanoseconds of energy confinement in the inertial confinement system. Now, there's basically two types of magnetic confinement schemes. One is called open-ended, or alternatively, uh, so-called linear machines. Um, and the other um, is called closed devices or toroidal. And if I just sort of uh, sketch the magnetic field structures, uh, you know, the open-ended, the classic, is a sort of mirror machine type of thing. Uh, it's you know, linear, it's in one direction, that sort of thing. Um, but it has ends on it, okay? On the other hand, the closed toroidal ones, what we have in mind is more or less a, a donut of some form with the magnetic field doing this. So those are the two uh, sort of basic schemes. And in both, of course, um, these are the B field lines. What you're counting on is that perpendicularly, uh, you're gyrating with a small gyro radius, typically of the order of tenths of a centimeter to a centimeter. And so perpendicularly, you have to the magnetic field, you have confinement of the particles to within centimeter, something like that. On the other hand, parallel, you can see there's a rather significant difference here. In the open-ended system, we have to figure out some way to plug up the ends magnetic mirrors and so forth, to some adequate degree, whereas in the toroidal device, we, hope to, we would hope to arrange it so that the field lines go around and bite their tails and are able to, um, uh, you know, close back on themselves. So what I next want to then talk about is, in fact, 
um, these two se these two schemes uh, separately. And what I'll do is for the remainder of, of uh, today, I'll be talking strictly about the open-ended or linear systems. And the next next time, we'll talk about the closed um, or uh, toroidal systems. So um, let's talk about uh, then open-ended Uh, or linear in a straight line, whatever, uh, magnetic confinement systems. Magnetic confinement of plasma, of course. The uh, basic idea um, is again parallel to a magnetic field. You just get the, um, well, I need to draw, I guess, one of my systems here. But parallel to the mag but perpendicular to the magnetic field, I have gyro motion parallel. I have um, some form of a magnetic mirror, so I'll try to draw that. I'll try to indicate how the coil structures go. Now, what I want to do is go through this uh, to kind of discuss uh, from various considerations, equilibrium, stability, particle orbits, collisions, all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, how do, how do you really go about putting together a magnetic confinement scheme for uh, fusion purposes? Um, now I could make this complicated but the simplest configuration to consider is a so-called axisymmetric configuration. What I mean is it's symmetric around this direction, around the magnetic axis, or the center of it, and just two coils. Okay, So the idea is then consider an axisymmetric magnetic mirror. And we'll modify this a bit as time goes on. Uh, first thing I might ask is, uh, does an equilibrium exist? Uh, and what I mean by that is a so-called MHD equilibrium. And why would I worry about that? Well, I put on this, let's call it a vacuum field that I induce by these coils. And then I throw in some plasma. And the question is, does the plasma tear all this up and, you know, cause some very distorted uh, magnetic field structure, which I can't, or which is not of any use to me. So that, that question goes under the generic heading of MHD equilibrium. Now, what you do, first off, we haven't talked too much about magnetic flux surfaces and stuff, but let me say that you define a magnetic flux function as the amount of flux um, going through, let's say, some area here. I, it's kind of hard, just blotchy, I guess. But anyway, you, you draw some little area that encompasses a certain bundle of magnetic fields, a certain amount of magnetic flux, and you call that a flux function. Then, having defined that, plus by axisymmetry, what you mean by axisymmetry is that the derivative with respect to angle of any variables are zero. So we've got d by d theta equals zero. These two comments together lead to, if you go through the MHD equations, you can show that the pressure is a function of psi, which is, maybe I should label this a bit more, I guess. So. Um, Psi is a variable which is sort of like a radial variable. Uh, theta is a variable which is an angular variable. And then my final coordinate will be something I'll call L, which is the distance along the magnetic field line at any position. 
So you can show that the pressure um, is of this form, and actually it's both P perp and P parallel are of this form. Uh, there's turns out there's perpendicular and parallel pressure. Now what, what equation did we solve when we talked about MHD equilibrium? Now we had J cross B equals grad P, right? That was equal, that was force balance equilibrium, or or zero is equal to J cross B minus grad P is force balance equilibrium. Well, I can use that to calculate. Uh, what I'd like to do is say, if I put some plasma in there, how much would it distort the magnetic field structure? Well, I can use this equation to determine the current that must flow because of the presence of the pressure gradient. And, of course, what we had was that this is the diamagnetic current, B cross grad P over B squared. Uh, now I know the current, and then I can use... Ampere's law, curl B, uh, is equal to mu naught J, perp. And let me put a kind of little tilde over this, which means that all this is going to be is the change in magnetic field brought about because of the presence of the pressure of the plasma, the fact that I have a plasma pressure. Well, without going through all the algebra, what you can see is that the change in B, uh, or I just guess I changed my notation here a bit, uh, the change in B over B is of the order of, if you sort of work through this, you'll find it's P over B squared over mu naught. Mu naught coming from Ampere's law, grad P from that, and both have a gradient in front of them or a directionality to the directional gradient. Well, it turns out that this is pressure over magnetic pressure, kinetic pressure over magnetic pressure, or kinetic energy density over magnetic energy density. And this is a parameter we earlier called beta. And so we usually end up arranging that this is much less than 1. So what this says is that, in fact, the MHD equilibrium uh, is more or less the vacuum one, that which I apply with the external coils, and that which is brought about by the presence of the plasma is just a small distortion on that. And you can show it's an axisymmetric uh, distortion, it turns out. So let's just say the net equilibrium is an order beta distortion Um, which happens itself to be axisymmetric, as well as the underlying vacuum, by assumption here. Um, of the, what's called vacuum, means before I put the plasma in, a magnetic field, that which is produced by the external uh, magnets. So the idea is that's not something we need to particularly worry about. It's um, something that you have to mechanically calculate um, for the details of the magnetic geometry and so forth. Next on our list of things we might care about would be the MHD stability. Now, let me redraw our magnetic field configuration over here. Again, probably not quite getting it right. Um, we've talked about this some before, but let's uh, reiterate it. Now, and I've got, I guess I ought to put my coils in here. Oops. Um, where is the magnetic field the biggest on this diagram? Well, it, the density of lines is the biggest right, you know, between the coil. Okay. Next biggest is sort of right there. It gets a little smaller along a field line. But the real small value, you know, the lowest density of field lines is in fact way out here. 
Now, for MHD stability, uh, it turns out if you had, had uh, gone back to our uh, sort of delta W type analysis, uh, change in energy due to the presence of a perturbation, um, you can show that it becomes an integral d cubed x of a perturbation dot grad p times a perturbation dot curvature. Remember, we had this curvature vector sort of idea, curvature of the field line vector. I guess I also need to indicate these field lines going this way. Now, you remember we had the concept of good curvature and bad curvature, okay? Or minimum B and maximum B. So if I sort of imagine I'm going to put a plasma in here, is it in a good curvature region or a bad curvature region? Well, if I look right under the mirror throat, okay, I can see that that's actually the good curvature sense, and the B field is actually the highest right straight on the coil. Okay, so it's, it's in a ma magnetic well. On the other hand, if I come back here to the kind of center of the plasma, you know, B out here is smaller than it is here, so I'm in a maximum B situation. I'm on the top of a hill, and the plasma is going to slide off via a Rayleigh-Taylor type instability. So it turns out we have both in this region bad curvature in a, in a simple magnetic meal, uh, machine, magnet, a magnetic mirror machine, and in this region good magnetic field curvature. What do we do then? Well, this basically says average over a field line. That integral over all, all space says average over a field line. And it turns out that you can show under fairly general situations, uh, you can show that this leads to net uh, inter what's called integral DL over B, which means a, just a proper average over uh, a flux surface here. Uh, so net integral DL over B average instability. Now, is this something I should worry about? You know, theorists come up with an instability and say it'll happen, and uh, do I worry about it? Well, the answer is very definitely yes. Uh, the early plasmas in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, were plagued by this particular Rayleigh-Taylor flute-like instability. So what they did to get around this uh, is they had to figure out some way to have the plasma be uniformly in a minimum B situation. Now, it turns out you can't do that in an axisymmetric situation. So what they did is they added another set of coils, which are in the business typically called Yaffe, after a Soviet scientist uh, who um, you know, proposed and, and did them. Uh, put, and put them on and tried them experimentally and showed that indeed if he created a minimum B situation he would in fact cause total stability, much better plasma confinement and so forth and so on. So what you have to do is you have to look at my picture here and now imagine I make a, a slice through it here and then I create a along that, let's call it this, this center line here, I'm not quite on the center but anyway, uh, I look at, well, I look end on then at this, and what I do is I put on four uh, wires that kind of extend along here, okay, but at different azimuthal angles theta, such that one coil has a current going in it, one out, one in, one out, and then um, what happens is the magnetic field lines, because of these four um, bars, Yaffe bars they're called, um, create a what's called a cusp field. Okay? But clearly this cusp field has the property that the magnetic field is in fact incredibly small there, right on axis, and it's big okay, up close to any of the bars. So when you combine these two fields, um, 
that due to the two Helmholtz coils, basically, on the ends that produce my magnetic mirror machine, and these four bars, then you can produce a minimum B system. So the idea is use four, or actually in Yaffe's original experiment, or six, you could do six of them too, uh, Yaffe bars to produce a minimum B stable system. And indeed, Yaffe was able to show that when he did this, uh, he got much better plasma confinement, you know, like orders of magnitude. And again, this is just, you know, if I told you to put a heavy liquid on top of a light liquid, you would say I was crazy. Uh, you can't do it. Um, and this is the equivalent of can't do it. Uh, now, if you look at, think about a field line here in this combined magnetic field structure. If I start over here from the left, it not only goes in and out, but now because of these cusp fields, it kind of wanders off in angle. And if you put all this together, what you find is that the net um, field is, is sort of like an ellipse at one end that's vertical, a circle in the center, which goes to a horizontal ellipse at the other end. Okay? Because you go up, you go through this central region here, and by the time you get to the other end, the ellipse has flipped um, direction, where the field lines now go from tip to middle to there, and like this. Okay. So these plasmas are sort of, when you put the combination together, they have sort of, uh, of Yaffe bars plus the axisymmetric mirrors, um, they have this particular um, elliptic uh, flux surfaces uh, on the end. If I drew an inner, more inner surface, let's see if I got a better pen for that, that would help. Uh, if I drew a more inner flux surface, a bundle of field lines, I'd be here. Okay. And those field lines would then go like this. So, and I can't really show the thing over here. It's extended the other direction. This is kind of the way to say it. Now, some people have uh, suggested that why not build one coil that combines both the Yaffe bars and the coils. And so generically what that does is it goes over, uh, over, over, well, <laughs> sort of arcs like this, and then back, and then uh, down under, and then back, and then um, like this. Don't think I've got it. Yeah, I've got it quite right. Anyway, you can either make it up out of one coil or out of two. And believe it or not, topologically, what you do in this case is you produce a curve which is equivalent to running current on the seam of a baseball. Okay? If you follow the seam, imagine that you run current on, on the seam of a baseball. I, I, I know I can't draw that. Okay? Uh, uh, you can show that you can produce a minimum B configuration. Makes an excellent doctoral exam question, oral question, by the way. You know, here's a baseball. What do you think a magnetic field geometry would do with that, right? Uh, anyway, so the comment is there are various ways of doing this. One of the particular ways that people do is the so -called, a so-called yin-yang, uh, developed from the Chinese language, uh, configuration, where you take one coil that does this and another one you put in it that does the opposite. And I don't know how to draw it here, but they, they, they fit together. Uh, in this way, okay? And again, you produce out of that a, an elliptic fan in the two directions, uh, but the elliptic fan goes vertical on one end and horizontal on the other. Okay, well, we better uh, quit here for a moment and uh, pause, and, but the basic idea is you can, by various of these schemes, produce for yourself a uh, minimum B magnetic field configuration 
then when you put the plasma in a minimum B configuration, there's very good evidence experimentally uh, that this is a much more stable plasma macroscopically. It may have a few small microscopic instabilities, but the macroscopic instabilities are well under control.